Great to see you, Lincoln. See you too, Paul. <laughs> so do you want to talk about um, Monster Sacre and how I put that together? Or? I would love to talk about it. Okay. I, it you know, it was a piece um, that I've been playing. When did you write it for me? It was oh it three years ago? Three years ago, I think. And yeah. I've played it probably 15 or 20 times um, to wonderfully enthusiastic audiences. So it would probably be best for you to start out since you wrote the piece. I can talk about how wonderfully it's been received at the zillions of places that I've played it over the planet. Right. But you should probably talk about the initial uh, creative process that birthed it. Right. Well, I have to, to say that I was thinking about who I was writing the piece for because I think that was, I, I, I composed it for you. For me. And so um, I, I've always loved your sense of, of uh, your, your, your sense of stage presence and your abilities on the, on the stage and your showmanship. And I really wanted to write a piece that allowed that to be at its maximum level as much as possible. And so uh, uh, I stumbled upon this term, Monstre Sacre, coined by Cocteau. Um, and I just started looking into what that meant. And, um, and it meant, you know, this, uh, uh, a kind of person that is extremely talented um, and ha and ad is adored by by millions and uh, is loved on the stage and can just be also as much of a performer off the stage as well and then there's this this life of of um, gigantic behavior and it could be rather naughty as well as we know and that is nothing about you I just I just thought well what a perfect person to to bring a piece like that to life and so uh, and so I wrote these pieces uh, you have to help me remember because it's been a while since I've composed it uh, four movements is that right that's correct and um, so uh, one of the one of the movements that I, I can talk about a little bit and, and especially I thought about you on is the is the one that I was thinking um, of uh, well, how I could uh, weave some Bach into it and yeah. pretend that you're Glenn Gould or yeah. you're something like Glenn Gould, uh, that somebody could come in and just take a theme or take several themes of, of Bach and just make a piece out of it or make a movement um, and just showcase this is the genius. And so yeah. that's, that was one of the things I wanted to do. So. Yeah, and it worked out so wonderfully. I mean, I, I, I programmed that work on my program of premieres recital that I did several times two years ago and then was able to recycle the Bach movement that you wrote on this homage program that I did last year and I'm continuing to do and will be doing all next semester uh, as well. But I think one of the wonderful things, and this is why I think this conference that we're at here at Biola is so important, is that there's so much new music that's being written that, that is really exciting audiences. And so every time I play your piece, I get this roaring ovation, mm. this roaring standing ovation, because it's one of those pieces that fits the piano like a glove, that spans the emotional gamut. So every, every wonderful emotion that you can be expressed in music is expressed in this you know, 20, minute, uh, 20 minute piece, but it's also a fabulous uh, pianistic workout. Mm -hmm. And so I'm thrilled to be able to play it you know, and even be able to incorporate the Bach movement um, last night mm -hmm. in my encore that I dedicated to you. Thank you very much. And, uh, uh, and we'll be playing it, you know, I'm on sabbatical next semester and I'll be playing in Korea and Taiwan and other places and wow. we'll be able to, to play it as well. One of the things that I just was so um, appreciative of with you is the, the investment you made in that piece. And it's not something that I, I experienced very much as a composer, um, is, you know, when you write a piece, of, a, a new piece, you're gonna get a couple of rehearsals and the performance and it may, that may be it for a while or ever. And what I loved about, uh, about your attitude with new music, at least with my piece, was that you, 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 you memorized it. I mean, yeah. a good deal of it. Yeah. I mean, and, and I just, I was floored by that kind of investment. And I'm wondering, is that, do you, is that something that you typically try to do with contemporary music as much as your well it, a lot of it a lot of it depends on the piece a lot of it depends on the venue and a lot of it depends on the food mm. <laughs> so um, because I love traveling yeah, and yeah, I yeah. love going to cool places that have great food okay and and your piece opened up so many wonderful doors remember the food we ate in San Francisco okay it was all because of your piece so I, I did your the right piece thing opened up so many culinary <laughs> avenues for us 
And uh, so, but yeah, I think that's one of the exciting things about being involved in new music, you know, because remember in San Francisco, I performed it at the American List Society yeah. Festival. Right. And it just happens that Franz Liszt was a wonderful proponent of new music. And so I get away with playing anything I want mm -hmm. at the Liszt Festival. Mm -hmm. And then of course my school, you know, where we played it, um, you know, there's a, a wonderful commitment. This is the University of Nebraska Lincoln. Uh, uh, has a wonderful commitment to new music and yeah. a wonderful commitment to me yeah. so I can pretty much pull off anything that I want there. Yeah. And so it was wonderful when, when we had that program where I flew you in from Malibu and I flew in another very good uh, friend of mine, Gilad, from New That's Jersey. Right. Mm -hmm. And then we Skyped in Father Ivan Moody from Portugal. Right. So all of us are there in spirit. Yeah. And, uh, but, and it was a phenomenal, we had a terrific crowd. And, and this is in, in, in Lincoln, Nebraska, um, but a, t a terrific crowd that was united around all of this new music. And yeah. so I, I thought it was, uh, was a, a, a wonderful experience. And I like to do that as many times as I can, mm -hmm. especially when we get to do it in beautiful places. Yeah. You know, and I obviously got to play it at Pepperdine and uh, you know, uh, looking forward to playing it uh, more. But yeah, we should probably talk about Father Ivan Moody yeah. at this point. Um, and I, I, I have an interest in that piece. And yeah. what, what's the name of the piece that he composed for well, you? Well, the quintet that I commissioned is entitled Nocturne of Light. Okay. And it's based on, uh, it's, it's, it's for string quartet and piano. And, uh, okay. and I told F Father Ivan that I wanted to have him write a piece for me that incorporated Byzantine chant. Because I've had other composers, Victoria Bond, for instance, you know, wrote the, the wonderful piece, Plotiri and Soterio, The Cup of Salvation. And I get to chant, and not only me, but I get to involve the audience because as you all know, Byzantine chant usually features a drone or what we call an e-song. Right. And it's perfect for audience involvement. Mm -hmm. So the mm -hmm. audience sings the pitch and, you know, believe it or not, we, we live in a fairly musically literate place. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Not too many people are tone deaf mm -hmm. and they can hold, especially when, and in fact, when I did the chapel a couple of days ago here at Biola, mm -hmm. I had a thousand voice e-song, mm -hmm. you know, because I had all of the students that were in the chapel do the chant with me. So it, it worked out really, really, really beautifully. So anyway, when I was talking with Father Ivan about the piece that he would write for me, I wanted to include a Byzantine chant, and that's all I told him. And then he decided that he was going to explore this mystical time in the life of Christ after the death, after he's died, before the resurrection. And there are all these wonderful scriptural references oh. about him visiting the spirits uh -huh. in hell. You know, and this is the time basically where Christ destroys death. Mm. You know, and the, the wonderful uh, resurrection hymn that the Greek Orthodox sing, Christ is risen from the dead, trampling down death by death, mm -hmm. and upon those in the tombs bestowing life. And it's based on the icon where Christ is grabbing by the wrists because we are powerless ourselves, grabbing Adam and Eve by the wrists and pulling them out of the gates of Hades. Mm -hmm. And there's this wonderful moment in the quintet where I get to pluck inside the strings. This is the breaking of the bonds mm -hmm. of Hades, mm -hmm. you know, where I have to get inside and I pluck in, in and that symbolizes the, the breaking of Hades. But the two hymns that he uses, one is the communion hymn, you know, for Holy Saturday, um, which is this gorgeous hymn talking about the God who sleeps. And you think about the irony, you know, and the paradox of the God who sleeps. Mm -hmm. And this, of course, all comes from the Psalms, awoke, restoring us to life. And then, and then, of course, Christ is risen comes in, Christos Anesti. And I'll have the opportunity to chant these all tonight, too. Um, mm -hmm. You're coming tonight, right? Mm -hmm. Good. Mm -hmm. And uh, we'll have a chance to have the audience participate in the Esau again. Um, and so the whole piece becomes this meditation on both the destruction of death by death and then Christ's resurrection, Christos Anesti. And Father Ivan's style is very slow paced. So the challenge is always because he's never ever creating this triumphalistic view of the resurrection, mm. but he's exploring really the transcendent mystical meaning of the resurrection and how our lives, even this side of eternity, can be transformed by that knowledge. And the way that he does it musically is through very 
a large uh, swatches of musical time. And so it's a real challenge as far as maintaining that slow, slow sense of pulse, um, but, but the, the musical effect can be really powerful. But you get that because uh, because you have your own faith in orthodox christianity and and you're a cantor as well yeah so yeah so uh, that must play you must sort of you're able to tap into that immediately don't you is that well, true well interestingly enough it also because that's a that's a real important aspect of it but as you know um i do a lot of work with philip glass and okay. and very committed to minimalism mm -hmm. as a musical option mm -hmm. you know and uh and that in and of itself is basically slowing down the whole harmonic palette in a way that, that, that allows you to, to be a little bit more introspective in terms of what you're, looking at, uh, what you're looking at musically. And of course, the pace of it kind of radically slows down. Mm -hmm. And so I think there's an interesting connection. I still remember riding in a cab with Philip Glass in New York a couple of years ago. He was on his way to a, uh, um, a rehearsal and uh, we had just had a session on the concerto that he was writing for me, the Lewis and Clark concerto. Mm -hmm. And we were talking about the relationship between Buddhist chant and Byzantine chant, uh -huh. you know, all of which basically deal with uh, a harmonically static environment. And so what it does is it forces your ears you know, to, to focus on other little things like melodic, you know, the slightest melodic nuances, and things like that. Uh -huh. And of course, this happened in Western music as well, you know, right. in terms of the development. Before we decided to go the harmonic route, there were all kinds of fascinating things happening melodically yeah, yeah. Uh, in, in the Western musical tradition. So anyway, um, I'm very looking forward to, to working on all of that uh, and, pre and presenting it to the Biola community tonight. Uh, in this recital, and they'll get a chance to experience that type of uh, long-range musical shaping. So, do you? I, I, one of the things I want to talk to you about um, is as um, is your your life as a concert artist. And here I am. I'm a composer, mm -hmm. and I compose concert music. Yeah. Um, and then we have sort of that world. Um, we're, I'm not saying that we're certainly separating ourselves out as from being Christians because we are Christians. But then there's there's the music for church. There's that world as well. Do you yeah. how do you sort of reconcile the two together? It's like okay, this is concert music. I sh this is this way, and this is this is church music, and should be this way. Do do you find do you bridge that gap at all? Yeah, it's in it's interesting. Of course, in my situation, you know, at our at our church, uh, you know, everything is done a cappella, and everything is 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 Byzantine chant. Right. So there's no. Um, you know, and that's the way it's been done for you know thousands of years, and it's that's yeah. not going to change. But it's very interesting because I was watching on uh, Facebook when I was on the plane, and there was this video of this Russian Orthodox priest doing hip hop, <laughs> and it was so interesting because obviously, and he was you know, and, it, and 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 I was watching the video, and it was in Russian, you know, but it was clear that he was talking about this this young kid who was dealing with drugs. Hmm. And, 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 and so he buys some drugs on the street and then ends up going into a church, you know, and of course in a beautiful Russian Orthodox church and he's so moved by that experience, of, by seeing the icons, of seeing the gold, of smelling the right. incense, of being in a sacred space that on the way out he tosses the drugs, uh. you know. Um, and so, but the point is it was done in a hip hop style, mm -hmm. musically, and mm -hmm. so, and just looking at the comments you know, uh, most of which were very negative because these were coming from <laughs> really conservative Orthodox right. types of saying he's a priest, you know, he should not be doing this at all. Mm -hmm. And there was this implication that somehow hip hop was going to make it its way into the divine liturgy, which of course will never happen. And that wasn't the point. Yeah. The point was this video was reaching, you know, a group of young people that it would not have reached any other way. Right. So, you know, and so obviously both of us, we have really eclectic musical tastes that doesn't necessarily mean that that's what's going to be used right you know in a worship context in well, any way shape or form what i've thought about is um i used to i used to be very um in my church tradition it's it's very different from yours i come from yeah. an evangelical fundamentalist tradition hundreds of years old <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh and the, um. the music worship is nothing has really nothing to do with my with my music life and i yeah. and i was sort of like okay that's this that's that okay and just that's the way it is um and then i just began under, began began thinking about what worship is 
does it really have to be just Sunday morning? Is that really just all the only time that we worship? And I, I, I began sort of bringing that idea of, okay, every, every moment of my life is worship. It should be worship. My concert music can be that. It can be when I'm at rest. It could be, yeah. um, and all of a sudden, when I had that attitude, I, I found myself bridging a lot more uh, musical styles that yeah. that's okay. This is, uh, mm -hmm. this is, this can be what it should be or, or for the moment, you know? Yeah. Um, so I don't, I don't know. That's, that was just yeah. sort of, because they, they were at, there was this, this question that came up about my piece today is about how, you know, what is, uh, could, could Tego Passion, uh, this piece that I composed, mm -hmm. f um, f uh, setting these texts by uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, could that be, uh, how does that, how could that play a role in the life in our uh, in Christian worship? Um, and I well I thought does that mean Sunday morning? Mm -hmm. And I just thought well it doesn't have to be this the separation of it. And uh, so anyway I, I, those are the kind of issues, issues yeah. I think about as a Christian with my right. own music. Right. Sort of, of course. How, of how course. that all ties together. Yeah. Well, and it's it's an interesting well it's a fascinating topic because I know in my you know in my tradition. Um, there's this idea that, again, everything kind of goes back to the incarnation of Christ. And the fact that Christ became a human being, you know, and inhabited matter, the matter that, that we have that's part of us, that that changes the whole nature of the created world. Right. So that everything has a sanctity to it that yes. it didn't have before that, yes. including time. And I was going to bring this up at the, at the chapel um, but I was talking a lot already, so decided not to. But this idea that matter matters, and that what we do with our bodies, that is all incorporated into the way that we worship. This is why taste and smell and what we see mm. and what we hear is all fundamental, you know, simply because Christ was here, mm -hmm. you know, when he inhabited this body. And when he was baptized in the Jordan, he sanctified water. And mm -hmm. so water becomes holy. So all of these things have an important impact in worship because of because of what Christ because of who Christ is and what happened in the incarnation and so this then rather than everything kind of being worship but then time is also kind of a part of our lives as Christians and so the way that we do morning prayers evening prayers you know this this time is is really changed mm. um, because of that so that yeah because it's definitely not just Sunday morning now it, it is it is the way that we live our lives exactly. because uh, time has been uh, transformed in that way as well. So the the it, it's in a slightly different way than what you were talking about, but those barriers have completely you know fallen down mm -hmm. because the way that we eat, mm -hmm. uh, the way that we the way that we think, the way that we expose ourselves to things, it's all been changed because of the life uh, and the work of Christ mm -hmm. in a very important way. Mm -hmm. So, but I, I, I have some more questions for you, though, as far as the, the creative process goes, because I, you know, one of the pieces that I did last night on my recital was this uh, transcription that I did for Joan Tower's birthday. Okay. You know, homage to Beethoven right. was the piece, her first piano I've heard concerto. That. Yes. And oh, it's a wonderful it's fantastic. work. And, uh, but I remember talking to her about this, and she was talking about the influences that came into her, you know, when she was writing and whether she would accept them or reject them. And so here she is, and she's a pianist. Mm. She's writing her first concerto, you know, and she wants to dedicate it, you know. Well, actually, she started out not necessarily wanting to dedicate it to Beethoven, but all these Beethoven piano sonatas started coming to mind. And so the question was whether she was going to fight Beethoven or whether she was going to invite Beethoven in to have a seat. And she eventually ended up inviting Beethoven in. Beethoven sits next to her, and he becomes a participant in the creative process. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was so fascinating, mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. know, about what do you do when it's clear that there's been a, an influence that's so profound on you, but yet then you've got, of course, your individual voice, you know, and all these kinds of things. So, and so this, this piece for Joan Tower was her way of dealing with the ghost of Beethoven. Right. So, and I just heard this unbelievable piece that you just did, the Tegel Passion, uh, that was performed not an hour ago, mm -hmm. and there were clearly wonderful references of composers that are important to you. So how do you, as a composer, deal with those ghosts? I, I, I think that um, I, I don't find myself thinking a whole lot about it. Remember, I'll say that off the, off the start, uh, because... Um, I think if I did, I, I wouldn't uh, 
enjoy myself as much as I do when I compose. <laughs> and, I, and I love borrowing ideas. I don't think I'm very good at mimicking styles extremely well, <coughs> which is probably a good thing. So, uh, <laughs> so I, can, I can sort of, uh, I, I, like for example, I love Frank Zappa. Yeah. So, um, and uh, I, I didn't really even know that I was doing some kind of metric things that Zappa was doing in his music until I went back and like started listening to my old albums again because I had forgotten a lot yeah. of the stuff and thought, oh my gosh, this stuff is still alive in my brain, <laughs> and I'm putting it into my music. Yeah. But it's it's been but but it it does get filtered so much that it becomes my own. So um, I don't I don't worry so much about it. Um, I. What I love doing is finding styles of music that I love, and then I kind of sit down with it, and I find those those moments that are extremely meaningful to me, and I and I I parse them out, and I just take that away, and then I make something of it, so that I don't I don't find myself writing except for the, t the if I'm just if I'm quoting Bach, I'm quoting Bach, but if right. I'm if right. I'm just in maybe there's some Prokofiev popping up in my music. Yeah. It's not that I'm thinking about a particular Pacofia piece, but there's some rhythm that I heard. I'm going to use that and then make it my own. So, right, right. Uh, so it just goes through a lot of filters, whether I'm cognizant of it sure. or not. Well, and it's also whether the what the audience is bringing to the table as well. Yeah. Because when right. when that wonderful piano ostinato comes in, and it was in some goofy, it was in seven or something. It was just so funky mm -hmm. and so wonderful. But because of the texture of the piano and the orchestra. And the fact that we're dealing with Nazis, instantly what <laughs> right. came to mind was Shostakovich yeah. and the Fifth Symphony. Uh, when that right. piano, cause, and here he's dealing with an evil regime, clearly, right. and dealing with it. And then in the context of this wonderful symphony, you've got that fabulous piano ostinato, dun gun 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 gun, you know, that comes in. Right. And but it was the texture of having this really interesting rhythmic ostinato played by the piano, the greatest instrument of all time, it by the is. way. Um, in the context of this large-scale orchestra work, right. that was the illusion. That and that, of course, brought everything that I brought to the table. Now, whether all of the Biola students right. had a love affair <laughs> with Shostakovich's <laughs> symphony or not, I don't know. You know. But the point is that yeah. that 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 came to my mind as a musician. Yeah. You know, whether they're, they're probably, of course, it wasn't conscious in your part. But the point is that's what you know. One audience member. You know, brought to it because of the combination of the instrumentation right. and your subject matter. Yeah. You know, uh, and it was a wonderful experience for me, whether it had any effect well, on me or not. <laughs> there was another ostinato at the very end in the last movement before the glorious uh, wordless chorus yeah. came in. Yeah. The piano had the dum, bum, bum. Yeah. That was a disco theme. I mean, <laughs> It was right. It was a dance theme that I had heard somewhere, and I made it my own. So I wonder if yep. maybe yep. somebody else. Yeah, yeah. Well, and I have to say though too that throughout the hurt, I heard some. <laughs> yeah, they, don't, we don't want you to see where that comes from, right? <laughs> no, but yeah, yeah. That's, but I think it, what it what it shows is 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 there's an interesting relationship between you know the creative process in terms of the audience also has to come to the table with the creative life. Yeah. You know, they have to have uh, they have to have associations. They have to have uh, an, an imagination themselves. Yeah. You know, and that imagination needs to be inspired. Obviously, as as your piece tremendously inspired my imagination as I was listening to it uh, for the first time, and I think that's a that's part of the the th for for me as a concert pianist. Um, being able to to have that interaction with an audience, mm -hmm. you know, where you mm -hmm. know that there's this dialogue happening. Yeah. Oh, it is so much fun. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, when that happens, and you have to be willing, as a performer, and, and there aren't, not everyone is, but there's a vulnerability, that it's just part of who I am. Right. You know, and I'll I'll let it out there, wrong notes and all, mm -hmm. and it creates this this vulnerability that allows for that interaction to take place mm -hmm. between the audience and the performer, which is. I think a, an incredible. I love that you said that about vulnerability, and I, and I, I was going to say honesty. I mean, mm. that, uh, audi audiences want that so much, mm. um, and um, and it's it's freeing to just to be able to just do that on the stage, and or as a composer to to put down something like I could use that theme if I want to, or yeah. something that's meaningful to me from when I was a teenager. Yeah, I can bring it into my music. Yeah, and 
and I'll connect with somebody. And th in this world, it's funny, an audience now is so eclectic in their experiences. H who knows what these what oh, people are bringing to the it. audience, or I are bringing it. to the concert. I know it. Well, and even you and me, I, if we took out our iTunes library, and yeah. look down there, oh. it would be so bizarre. <laughs> yes. You know, it's funny because when I teach my piano literature class at the university, yeah. you know, I plug in my laptop, you know, to, uh, you know, to the screen. And so I'll be going to, you know, Beethoven, you know, right now, uh, last lecture was on Beethoven and Schubert, you know. Right. And so I'm, but, and then my iTunes library is right there. Right. So, and I'm just, and then what I'm scrolling through to get to Schubert and everybody's seeing it, yeah. you know. <laughs> you yeah. know, it's just so crazy in terms yeah. of the different you know musical experiences yeah. that and and we're old right we're old guys yeah. so i don't know what uh, well i'm a lot older than you but uh but then yeah for these kids that are in their 20s mm -hmm. you know uh strangely enough their their uh itunes list is probably not going to be as whacked out as ours hmm. you know just because yeah. of yeah. the of the experiences right. that you and i have had yeah you know and of course the the communities that we deal with and because i've got my whole crazy Byzantine side, yeah. you know, where I've got so many different flavors of chant that are out there on the planet, <laughs> right. you know. Um, and then, of course, my, my passion for earth, wind, and fire and all of that right. part of my life. And, and then, of course, my commitment to, you know, the Western classical mm -hmm. tradition. And it creates this really bizarre, you know, amalgam, but, that, but that's my musical identity. Did you used to worry about that? I mean, I used to be sort of like, okay, this is, I, I don't want to let anybody know that I'm listening to Daft Punk. <laughs> But I don't wear. I don't care anymore. I don't no, care. And I think no. I used to care a lot about what people yeah. thought of, like of, of my listening list. You yeah. Know? But, yeah. Well, <laughs> you know, my my son uh, is a uh, a budding pop punk artist. Mm -hmm. You know, of course, I have all of his recordings in my iTunes library too, and yeah. those pop up uh, yeah. for easy listening. And uh, <laughs> you know, where before I'm preparing my Schubert lecture, and uh, but you know, and I'm I, and when we, he and I have discussions, you know, and he's he's a terrific musician, but I'm encouraging him to really, you know, expand, and I challenge him to be as open-minded right. as his dad is, yes. you yes. know, about musical influences. That's right, you know, and he's yeah, you know. I think our, and our our students um, they need to see that too that we're yeah. we're open and that they should be as open to the standard repertoire as well as the oh yeah crazy stuff oh, yeah. happening now. Very much so. But, you know, I, 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 I tell all of my students this because uh, a good deal of my life, is de you know, as, as is yours, is, is dedicated to shaping the lives of young, you know, college-age students. And, uh, and I just tell them that I think this is a very, very exciting time mm. uh, to be a musician because there are so many really fabulous composers like you out there that you can invest, you know, your time and your talent into. And the payoff is really rich on every level, just in terms of your ability to, mm. to inspire audiences, but yet also to feed your own you know, musical soul. Because yeah. there's a fact where if you are not being fed musically, yeah. then you will die. You, yeah. know, you, will, you will become less creative mm -hmm. and you'll kind of calcify. And there are a lot of people out there where there's not a, there's not a unique idea to be had and mm. it's over. Mm. And uh, but when you you know when you're dealing with composers that are that are creative, that are writing music that's really changing uh, people when they hear it, uh, that's it's an incredible way to live. Right. So I feel very very yeah. lucky to be able to play your pieces uh, to tonight to be able to play uh, Ivan's um, you know really wonderful quintet. And and it, what's also great about the fact that we're here during this conference um, are are the other composers you know, that I've met, many of whom are writing really, really wonderful stuff. Great. And so I think yeah. it's, I think it's really, really encouraging yeah. for us to be it's here. It's a, spe a special time to be here, uh, to have a conference that deals with issues of Christianity as well mm. as good mm. new music. It's just a great time to be here. Yeah, yeah, I would agree totally, so.